Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion. I'm Susan Monroe, Deputy Director with Chambers for Innovation and in Clean Energy. At CICE, as past Chamber of Commerce Directors, we assist Chambers of Commerce and economic development leaders as they navigate clean energy opportunities in their communities. Today, Chambers of Commerce and economic development organizations are claiming their seat at the table when it comes to clean energy amplification and climate discussions, and here's why. Clean energy and climate are everyday conversations in the business and policy world, with renewable energy becoming the cheapest form of new electric generation and 70% of Fortune 100 companies setting clean energy goals, the transition is undeniable. Clean energy is cheap, in demand, creating jobs faster than any other industry and generating billions of dollars of investment across the nation. Ohio is no exception. Here's what's on the line with utility scale solar in the Buckeye State. $18 billion of investment across the state. $67 million in tax revenues, a large portion going to schools as well. Many of you know this. More often, these projects will be the largest taxpayer in the county, providing stable, recession-proof tax revenues for up to 30 years or more. Big burst of local spending, including electricians, excavators, engineers, seed providers, fabricators, vehicle sales and service, restaurants and lodging, and a heads up to those of you receiving a portion of the hotel motel tax and lodging, that'll be a big income producer for you. Big burst of job creation, good paying, put food on the table and pay the mortgage type opportunities for thousands of Buckeyes. And with increasing weather and market uncertainty, utility scale solar provides stable income for landowners, helping to keep that family farm in the family. Solar is an attractive clean energy source for corporations looking to procure clean energy. Many of your member businesses have aggressive clean energy and sustainability goals, and they are looking to expand, build, and grow in communities that welcome and support those goals. Solar will provide cheap clean energy for all Ohio ratepayers for decades to come. And finally, utility solar will provide an opportunity for Ohio to export its energy versus importing. Utility scale solar built in Ohio by Ohioans. If you're on today's call, your community is more than likely going to be a recipient, a part of that $18 billion of investment. So this morning, we're gonna dive deep into what large scale solar looks like at the local level, what's involved in the state permitting process, and what the heck is that pilot all about anyway? And does it make sense for your county? Joining us today to help us navigate all of this, Holly Underwood from the Hardin County Chamber and Business Alliance, who will introduce Ryan Van Portfleet from Invenergy, a major solar developer in Ohio, Matt Butler, with the Ohio Power Siding Board, and Christine Pirick with Dickinson Wright, who will discuss the pilot program, Payment in Lieu of Taxes. As a former Chamber of Commerce president in Van Wert County, home to the largest wind farm in the state, I have witnessed firsthand the impact of the injection of millions of dollars in the community, thanks to renewable energy investment and the tax revenues it generates. Now, Harding County is getting their turn. I am pleased to welcome President and CEO and Director of Economic and Community Development at the Hardin County Chamber and Business Alliance, Holly Underwood. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Susan. I'm glad to be here today. Um, as she said, I'm with the Hardin County Chamber and Business Alliance, and we serve as the Chamber of Commerce for the entire county, as well as serving in the economic development role for Hardin County, which has seen a lot of renewable energy development in the last couple of years, including two major wind farms. And now we've got um, several large scale solar projects that are going on with Invenergy. The economic impact for our county with renewable energy development is millions of dollars in new sustainable tax revenues with significant new funding for our schools for decades to come. Many of you on this call this morning have that same opportunity. To help provide a deeper look at the local timeline for large scale solar development, 
I'm pleased to introduce one of our chamber members, Ryan Van Portfleet with Invenergy, a major solar developer within Hardin County. Ryan is a renewable development manager overseeing large scale projects through construction within the Eastern half of the United States. He is focused on 10 plus major projects within Ohio that would generate over 1500 megawatts of renewable energy throughout the Buckeye State, including three projects in Hardin County. Ryan, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Holly, and, and thanks to Susan for uh, setting up this presentation today. So briefly, I'm going to try to run through uh, the review of kind of Invenergy, our Ohio projects, and our ability to kind of take these projects through uh, conception all the way to construction and how to partner with local chamber and economic development folks. Uh, so I am having a little bit of difficulties trying to share my screen. I'm seeing that the host is disabled participant screen sharing. Um, so if, if Susan or Michaela can help me with that, that would be excellent. All right, and we are on. So very good. So uh, as you see here on my screen, um, I just want to give a quick overview and hopefully you can see an agenda for today. Uh, funny enough, here's a picture on the right. Uh, here's some of my colleagues and I actually at the Hardin County Fair. I believe it was two weeks ago. As Holly mentioned, we are uh, chamber members. We've been chamber members for uh, probably for the last almost decade or so. Uh, but quickly, I just want to run in through an introduction of myself, introduction of Invenergy, uh, why we see this large influx of solar projects coming into Ohio, uh, run quickly through the development timeline of these solar projects in the process. In addition to that, uh, a key part of my job is the community engagement and impacts to local communities. I'll kind of dive through that a little bit today. Um, so to start off very quickly, um, my name is Ryan Van Portfleet. I'm a senior manager here at Invenergy. Uh, Invenergy, we are the nation's leading private uh, renewable energy company and sustainable energy solutions provider. So on this map here, you can kind of see our global approach here, but, but we are headquartered in Chicago, which is a very short drive or flight over to Ohio. And you can notice that there's a lot of development specifically that we focused on uh, uh, domestically. Um, you see the green dots here showcase a lot of our wind projects and, and Invenergy has been around now for 20 years, specifically in the natural gas and wind space up front. And probably in the last five to 10 years, uh, we've seen a huge jump in solar development, specifically in areas uh, throughout the United States. And so I would, wouldn't be surprised here in the next five to 10 years that each of these green dots will be overtaken by yellow dots as we continue to see solar being more prevalent within the United States. Uh, but high level more about Invenergy, uh, to date we've developed and built over 187 uh, renewable energy projects throughout the world. Um, as I mentioned previously, we do have our headquarters here in Chicago. Uh, but we also have offices in Denver, Toronto, uh, Mexico City, Medellin, Colombia, uh, Tokyo, Japan, and also in Warsaw, Poland. Um, of those 187 projects that we have developed, that is over 29 gigawatts of energy, in which basically equates to over 8.4 million uh, homes powered by our projects, which equates to over 9 million cars off the road and in, in the amount of emissions we've taken off the, the grid in terms of power. From there, maybe getting more local, specifically in the state of Ohio, in which I've been working in for the last two years now, um, I want to talk about our, our quick experience in the state. So Invenergy, I believe we're, we are first movers in the state of Ohio in regards to solar development. Uh, we, we've been working in Hardin County uh, for over 10 to 11 years. Originally, we did have some wind development in the area, but transitioned to solar probably around 2017. Um, and you could see here on the left on our projects that have basically gone through the Ohio Power Siting Board process. And we do have Matt Butler on from the, the, the OPSB here to kind of talk about that process a little bit more. But uh, we have actually been successful in permitting one of the first projects, the Harden One project, that is a 150 megawatt project that is online and running now. Uh, we are actually beginning construction of our Harden Two project, which is another 150 megawatt uh, project in Hardin County. And we recently just got approval from the OPSB for our Hardin 3 project, which is a 300 megawatt project out in, in Hardin County. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, we have an additional project in the southeastern portion of the state uh, in Benton County, and that are going through the permitting process for our Cadence Solar Project located in Union County, our Pleasant Prairie Solar Project located on the western edge of Franklin County, 
and our Yellowwood Solar Project located down in Clinton County. So we're kind of all over the state so far, and we look forward to continuing to work with uh, local chamber members uh, to, to continue to uh, allow for investment in local communities as we continue to grow our, our portfolio within the state. And so a lot of questions I have when, when entering into project development uh, within Ohio, a lot of folks say, say why Ohio? Um, I'm sitting here in Chicago today and it is still somewhat cloudy. And, and a lot of folks are saying, well, it's, it's cloudy often during uh, the winter time, especially in Ohio. And, and what we've seen over the probably the last five to 10 years is such an influx of technology and investment in solar that not only has led to the declining cost of solar to make it cost competitive, as you can see here in the top right kind of graph. Uh, but in addition to that, we've seen just the, the investment that allows for these, these solar panels themselves to collect a lot of energy, even during times where it is cloudy, which makes it a, a good investment for us. And, and over the life of these projects, we are still producing enough power to make it very competitive. Um, so that competitive nature is kind of brought in the demand that has allowed for a lot of investment within the state and kind of within the United States. Um, you can see here on the bottom right, uh, an article from the Columbus Dispatch on how AEP is looking to reduce their carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. And, and we believe renewable energy is a huge part of that. Um, but also in addition to that, we've seen a huge amount of influx of demand from the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Amazons of the world that want to either reduce their carbon footprint or even go to a point where they are net zero from all of their energy usage usage throughout the United States or even within the state. Um, and so both those drivers from a, a utility demand from, from an AEP of the world or a commercial industrial demand from a from a Facebook or a Google. Uh, that's why we've seen such an influx of projects. And that's why we kind of see our, our large portfolio within the state, because uh, ultimately at Invenergy, we are a, a builder, owner, and operator of these facilities. And so uh, we will need to work with partners uh, all over the place from, from construction partners to, to uh, utility partners to folks that eventually buy the power. And so that, that I'll get into that a little bit here in a second, but that's why we've seen such a large influx of solar within the state. And we, we are very bullish in terms of our developments here. And uh, maybe just taking one step forward uh, that uh, basically kind of set the scene about Invenergy, uh, set the scene why we've seen such a uh, large influx of development within, within the state. And I want to kind of briefly run through what the development process looks like. Um, so a typical schedule for us, we'll say, uh, assuming maybe we, we go in into the state in 2018, we say, hey, we do see a lot of demand growing within the state. Let, let's begin to see if we can build a project out in a particular county in Ohio. Uh, the development timeline for us is a long, long process. And so development for us is basically when I, I, I say conception of a project, basically coming up with an idea of what makes a good project all the way into putting a shovel into the ground. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more here in the next couple slides, but this is a long process. It can take up to five years, can, can take up to 10 years. I recently finished a project out in Maryland in which we actively began uh, leasing properties in 2006. So that project was about 15 years old until we actually moved forward with the construction. So there's a lot of uh, boxes we have to check, a lot of items we have to work through. A lot of it in the state of Ohio is through the OPSB to go forward to construction. Um, and then for, for the projects of which we are kind of talking about in Energy and what we've seen in the state of Ohio, the construction period typically lasts, I would say, uh, a year or two, uh, depending on the size of the project, depending on the project timeline, depending on the, the available workers to help build the project, that, that period can be from 12 to 18 to even 24 months of construction activities on site. And then from there, we expect many of these projects, as, as uh, Susan briefly mentioned on the front, and to, to last for over 30 years. The, the, the goal of these, these projects are effectively to have them sit out uh, and, and just collect the sun. So once these projects are built, it's, it's in our interest, it's our investors' best interest, our, our power buyers' best interest to kind of let these projects kind of go out there and, and do their job and just sit there and collect the sun over the life of the project. And so before even these projects go forward, um, I like to kind of use a metaphor on, on almost like a chair of sorts of, of a solar project uh, needs four legs to stand and actually go forward. 
And so to do that, I assume the, the four legs for these projects actually go forward are suitable land and support, uh, supportive community, access to transmission, our land use permit, and an energy offtake agreement. So first and foremost, when I go and look to develop these sites, the, the thing I'm looking for is that suitable land and the supportive community. Uh, the suitable land for us typically lends itself to agriculture, uh, but we are actually developing a site in the southeastern portion of the state is, is on a former uh, mountaintop coal mine. And what we are looking for, we're looking for flat land, uh, land that is typically large parcels that would allow for us to have a, a vast project. And then in addition to that, we're looking to find that supportive community that would be partners with us as we move for, through the development process. Uh, we recognize that with a large change of use, uh, not, a, not everyone is going to be thrilled with, with our proposal, but I do believe there's a great story to tell with the reduction of, of emissions globally. But in addition to that, I like to really focus on the investment in the community from our landowner payments to uh, the investment in terms of jobs, the investment in a large infrastructure project coming in. And then at the end of the day, the large tax of dollars that will be coming in from the project. Um, from there, once we kind of find some suitable land, we want to make sure that suitable land is near transmission. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the power from our particular project is able to go on to the grid and then uh, basically allow for our buyers to utilize that power as well. So you'll often find these projects to be suited or, or cited by uh, large either substations or large transmission lines to allow for us to put the power on the grid and, and allow for our, our users to use that power. Um, in addition to access transmission, uh, we will need to go forward and get our land use permit. Uh, again, Matt Butler is on today from the OPSB that will go into that and, and the, the rigors the OPSB has in the state of Ohio for uh, these particular projects. And then again, last thing we'll need is that energy offtake agreement, uh, either that, that AEP or that Google or the Facebook that would want to purchase the power. And once we do have those four items in place, typically we'll go forward with a, with a project and then we'll see it through the construction period. And it, it's worth also mentioning that not every single project uh, that we, we cite goes, goes forward. I would say of the, we'll say 25 projects that we find potential suitable land from a desktop perspective, maybe we'll run into some sort of issues up front. Um, a lot of that kind of I, I highlight here from uh, negotiating leases or, or options with landowners, maybe we'll have some issues there, or maybe we'll have issues with our interconnection queue, meaning when we uh, work with the, the interconnection operators to allow for us to inject power into the grid. There's a lot of hurdles we'll have to work through there. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we have to do a lot of on-site diligence and fatal flaw assessments to determine how we are going to construct these projects. And there's often a lot of kind of random items that would come up to, would, that would preclude development. And so uh, that's to say that of, we'll say, 20 projects that we do find, I would say maybe half of those actually turned into a, a, a project in terms of we begin to lease some, some, some land itself. But then I would say of those 10 that we begin leasing activities on, I would say maybe three of them are able to kind of go through each of these development activities and successfully go through the Ohio Power uh, uh, Siding Board permitting process. And so quickly, I want to run through uh, community engagement and impact. So this is a huge thing for us as Invenergy, as I mentioned previously, we're a builder owner operator. Uh, so, so we want to be members of the community up front, uh, recognizing we are going to be in the community. Uh, we'll have Invenergy employees building the project, Invenergy employees operating the project for upwards of 35 years. Uh, so, so through our portfolio, we're really proud of the upwards of $260 million we've given in 2020 to local communities in terms of, of wages and benefits to our employees out in these, these areas and state and local taxes. In addition to that, we're very proud about how we've hired up to 10% of veterans of our local workforce that are helping build these projects and, and operate them on that side. In addition to that, we, we do really want to focus on the local community and what organizations we can partner with to ensure that we are having the most amount of impact in these areas. And, and in that too, I think impact's a huge thing associated with solar. Uh, this, is a, this is a study pulled from Ohio University that looks into the total jobs, the economic impacts, the, the pilot revenues associated with the potential of solar coming into the state. And so you see some massive numbers uh, from either a low development scenario, which is kind of a lighter green or of aggressive development scenario, which is that kind of darker green of up to 
$9.6 billion of total economic impacts within the state if a lot of projects were to go through. That means $68 million of pilot revenue in which uh, Christine Perrick will talk about today. And so this is a huge, huge amount of investment we believe in the state of Ohio. And I think it, as, as long as these projects are developed appropriately, this could be an economic boon for the state. And, and again, uh, it, for us, um, involvement in the community is huge. We wanna get in early. We want to introduce ourselves. We want to tell the Invenergy story, and we want to make sure that we're listening to questions and concerns, not only from the, the economic development side of the, the, the county, but also local landowners. And so once we do have a, a project in hand and we believe the project is going to go forward, outreach is a huge part of my job where I've spent a, a lion's share of this year out in the local communities, knocking on doors, meeting with economic officials, meeting with township trustees, meeting with county commissioners to ensure that they are able to learn about the project, uh, are able to hear the, the kind of pain points often that we, we see, maybe some misinformation that flies around a lot of these projects and ensure that uh, they feel like this project is a good investment as well. And, and at the end of the day, we need partners for these projects go forward. If we don't have those partners, often these projects are not successful. And I think we've been lucky to date to partner with, with Holly in, in Hardin County to receive that, that local support. And a lot of that is that on the ground work, knocking on doors, um, sending out mailers, um, giving out my cell phone number, answering calls at any, any time during the day to make sure again, that folks are able to know what's going on in their community, know what this investment looks like and, and feel like this is a good opportunity for them. And then again, a big portion of this project and, the, and a good part of the, the sell for us is the payments when the projects go forward. Here on the right side of the screen, you could see a breakdown of the pilot total for our Harden 1 and Harden 2 projects, which are upwards of 300 megawatts. You can see that yearly we will invest over $2.7 million in Hardin County, breakdown from uh, how that goes to the school district here in the center, how that goes to the county general fund, how that even goes to the sheriff. This is a lot of dollars kind of coming in. And I believe from this point forward, uh, our projects will be one of the largest tax bases in, in Hardin County. And again, Chris Pierre will be on today to talk more about the specifics here, but this is a quick snapshot of where you could see where a lot of these dollars will be going through once these projects go forward. And so with that, uh, I want to make sure that I give Matt Butler enough time to run through the Ohio Power Siding Board process, which again, it was a huge, huge step for us to ensure that we can invest in these local communities. And so Matt, uh, I will transition to you and I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, good morning, everyone. Appreciate uh, being here with you and uh, the Chambers for Innovation and Clean Energy putting this event together. Uh, my name is Matt Butler. I'm, a, I'm an administrative officer with the Ohio Power Siding Board, and I'm here this morning really to share uh, information about our process, the way that works uh, from a developer standpoint, but also uh, to provide some information about the ways that uh, you as members of the community and business owners can get involved in that process. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Make sure that works out okay. Okay, I think we're uh, ready to roll here. Um, so the Ohio Power Siding Board is um, the state of Ohio agency that is charged with reviewing major utility facilities. And it is a, it's an agency that's comprised really of several other different state agencies. So our board is comprised of seven voting board members. Uh, six are the directors of the different state agencies that you see there on your screen. So. Our membership includes uh, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission, who chairs the board, as well as the directors of the Ohio EPA, Ohio Department of Agriculture, Development, Natural Resources, and Health. And then our seventh voting board member is a professional engineer who is appointed by the governor. Now, in addition to those seven voting board members, we have four non-voting board members who come to us from the state legislature, two from the Ohio Senate, both a Democrat and Republican, and the same from the Ohio House of Representatives. Um, the board is also served by a technical staff that's drawn from those member agencies. Um, I myself work at the Public Utilities Commission, but we have staff from each of those other agencies who work on the review. And we also draw on staff expertise from other state and federal agencies 
including the uh, Ohio History, uh, Ohio Historic Preservation Office, the Ohio Department of Transportation, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So our role at the board is to review applications for what are called major utility facilities. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but in doing that, we're going to assure that the project benefits Ohio's citizens, promotes the state's economic interests, and protects Ohio's environment and land use. While the board does have sole jurisdiction over projects like this, public and local government participation are strongly encouraged, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, when a project is approved by the board, we issue a certificate, another word for a permit, for the life of that facility. So we're there for the construction, but, but also the maintenance and the operation of that facility going forward. So what is a major utility facility? Well, the main reason we're here today is to talk about solar and solar facilities at 50 megawatts or greater fall underneath the board's jurisdiction. Anything that falls below that is subject simply to local zoning authority. For wind, our jurisdiction begins at five megawatts and for fossil fuel powered electric generation, our jurisdiction begins at 50. Um, also important to note, I think too, that the board does have a role with the siting and review of both electric transmission lines in the state and certain types of natural gas transmission lines. So from a, from a solar perspective, we're seeing a lot of activity across the state, as you all know. Um, most of that activity has been over the past two years, and the majority of it has been in the western half of the state, as you see there on the map. And I think, as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact, I believe, that there are, there's flat available ground in, in that western half of the state. Um, there are large parcels, and it's a little less challenging, I think, in general, to develop that side of the state than it is to develop the more hilly um, eastern portion of the state. The chart on the right shows where these projects are in our review. Um, again, the Harden facility that Invenergy developed is uh, the only project that's currently in operation in Ohio right now that the board has reviewed. But you can see there in the orange color that there are a number of projects that have been approved. Some of those are under construction. And then the large list uh, in the pink color towards the bottom is all the projects that are in some state of review. Um, they may be have progressed all the way through the, the review process that I'm going to review here in a moment. They may have a certificate. I'm sorry, they, they may be just short of a certificate. Um, or they may still be in a pre-application stage where we haven't actually received the, uh, the permit application. So from the standpoint of our process, um, our process really is divided into five parts, if you think of it. This flow chart looks a little overwhelming at first, but as I break it down, I think it'll become more clear. Uh, we have really the pre-application phase at the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And the key piece of that is the applicant's public informational meeting. That's their opportunity to introduce the project officially to the public. By this point, most developers will have already had discussions with um, local landowners and local officials um, and business owners regarding the project, but this is really the kickoff meeting for the power siding board process. As we move to the right in that first top row, um, application submittal is the next step. And the first thing that our staff will do at the, at the board is take up to two months to review that application and ensure that it in fact contains all the necessary information for the staff to begin its investigation. Once that application has been deemed complete, as we say, we move forward to the investigation phase. And that really is where the staff is really digging in, um, doing a, a technical review of the application materials, but also asking questions of the developer, making data requests, visiting the site to ground truth, the information that's contained in the application and coordinating with the other board member agencies and um, non-board member agencies at the federal and state level before issuing a report that makes a recommendation to the board members themselves. 
After the investigation phase, we have the hearing phase. Um, that includes both a local public hearing that's held in the project area and an adjudicatory hearing that's held at our offices in Columbus. And then once all the hearings are complete and the record is closed in the case, the project goes to our board members to schedule the case for a vote at one of their monthly board meetings. Um, if parties are still unhappy with the decision that the board makes, we do have a rehearing process. And then ultimately, uh, projects can be, the board decisions can be appealed to the Supreme Court of Ohio. So the various steps along the way where the public can get involved and participate in the process. The first is that public informational meeting where the developer will ed educate the community about the project. They'll have maps, uh, generally in an open house format, and be able to answer questions and take feedback from members of the community. The board is also present at that meeting to provide information about the siting process and public participation. At any point during the board's process, we will accept informal written comments. And in each case, we often get uh, dozens of these, both in opposition to a project and in support of a project. But that's um, the public's opportunity to provide information to the staff really during its review. And then staff can uh, investigate those concerns during the course of its review and ask questions of the applicant um, if it deems necessary. The local public hearing, as I mentioned before, there are two hearings. The local public hearing is the first, and that's where the board obtains sworn statements from members of the public. Anyone can come to this meeting and testify whether they're in support of or in opposition to a project. And that hearing transcript becomes part of the official case record that the board must base its decision on. The adjudicatory hearing is a more formal hearing held in Columbus where the developer the OPSB staff and any other formal parties to the case will present testimony and evidence and face cross-examination from one another. Now, there is an opportunity for individuals, local governments, uh, or organizations to get involved in that hearing. There's a step called intervention that, that must occur um, to participate as a party of record in the case, be served with all the documents, participate in the adjudicatory hearing, and potentially file for rehearing or appeal a decision to the Supreme Court. But that is a more formal option that is available um, for public participation. I'm not gonna go through these one by one, but uh, just so you can briefly see the, the de decision criteria that the board must base um, its case decisions on. Uh, the first is uh, only for electric transmission and gas pipelines, so that does not apply to the case of solar uh, or other generation projects, but the other seven do. And as you can see, as you read through those on your screen, um, those cover a pretty wide range of impacts. So environmental impacts, socioeconomic impacts, uh, impacts to air and water, air navigation, um, the public interest, does the project serve the public interest, impacts to agricultural land and water conservation practices as well. So in reviewing the full case record, the board has to base its decision still on these eight criteria. If and when a project is approved by the board, again, we monitor through construction and operation and maintenance to ensure compliance with the terms of that certificate. Just to note a few key items that are required in each case, um, the developer will have to establish a complaint resolution process so that if there are concerns from uh, community members during construction and operation, there's a means to address those concerns. They will have to obtain all required transportation permits and coordinate with the local authorities on those issues. They'll have to avoid and minimize any damage to field tile drainage and repair or replace uh, damaged or broken field tiles at their expense. Uh, one question we get a lot is what happens at the end of the, the useful life of these facilities. And that's why we have decommissioning requirements in place so that the developer must submit a decommissioning plan that's prepared by a registered engineer for the board to review. And they must have in place a performance bond to ensure that funds are available for decommissioning. And that bond has to be adjusted 
every five years. I just want to leave uh, with some contact information here. Um, if you have not visited our website already, I highly encourage you to do that. A lot of the information that I've gone over today is discussed in greater detail there. Uh, there's information if you have a project in your community, there's information specific to each case, uh, upcoming hearings and events that may relate to those projects. And then our docketing information system, which is a subset of our website, is where you can um, log in and view all the information that has uh, accumulated in a case from the application through to the staff report of investigation, the hearing transcripts, and ultimately that board decision. All that information is available publicly on our site. And of course, on the right-hand side of your screen there, some contact information, always willing to have, have a conversation if you have any specific questions about a project in your community. And with that, I am going to hand the presentation off to Christine Pirick, who is an attorney with Dickinson Wright, and she'll be discussing the pilot program. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so that we have a, a slideshow with regard to the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, my name is Christine Pirick as Matt mentioned, and I work with the law firm of Dickinson Wright. Uh, we work with a number of developer, developers for the permitting of their projects, as well as the process for the payment in lieu of taxes with the Ohio Development Services Agency. Um, prior to joining Dickinson Wright, um, I, I did work uh, for the Public Utilities Commission and the Ohio Power Siting Board uh, for approximately 32 years. Um, so I'm very excited to be in this industry working with um, these folks and their cases. Um, generally speaking, the pilot program is a tax abatement program that is under the tax statute, the revised code 5727-75. Um, it involves seeking approval from the local boards of county commissioners. Um, and in addition, there is some recently enacted legislation that also adds to the involvement of the county um, that's separate and apart from the pilot process. And we're not here today to, to talk about that piece of it. We're gonna focus on the pilot program itself. Um, the pilot program began in 2010 uh, when the General Assembly passed uh, Senate Bill 233-32 to ensure that there was a predict predictable tax climate for owners of renewable energies um, and, and ensure that, that there was a, a consistent impact on county taxing units um, that they could rely on. It's a permissive legislation that was created to ensure that the counties um, could determine how um, they wanted to tax the renewable energy projects. Um, under the statute, under uh, Senate Bill 232, which is in uh, 572775 of the revised code. Uh, the developers need to meet certain conditions and must remit annual uh, payments to the county um, with regard to their real and personal property tax. And as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, it is a large amount of money on an annual basis. Uh, for example, that he showed $2.7 million annually um, for the Hardin solar projects so far in that county. Um, originally, when the pilot program was initiated, there was a sunset. However, that sunset has been extended several times. Currently, the sunset ends at the end of 2024. Um, to qualify, a, pro a project must have construction uh, before January 1st 2023, and it must be placed in service and providing commercial operation prior to January 1st, 2024. Under the pilot statute, the developer must make annual payments. Um, the first segment is $7,000 per megawatt. It's allocated to the taxing units within the county where the property is located. And it's according to the usual existing tangible personal property 
in local tax levies and rates. There's also a discretionary amount of $2,000 that the county can require. Um, this $2,000 would then be deposited directly into the county's general revenue fund, and the county can utilize that fund for whatever they are um, authorized to use it for. So there is a cap of $9,000 per megawatt, $7,000 going to the taxing units, and potentially $2,000 going to the county general fund. To become what we call a qualified energy project and receive the pilot, um, the project must apply to the Ohio Development Services Agency and provide an application. Uh, once the Development Services Agency receives the application, it sends that application to the county and the county has 30 days to provide ODSA one of two things, a resolution from the county that approves the pilot application for that specific project, or a showing that the county has determined that the county will be an alternative energy zone open to these projects. Um, the county can request additional time to review uh, from the Ohio Development Services Agency, but typically it is done within 30 to 60 days, uh, some response to the application. If the county approves the project, then the Ohio Development Services Agency issues what's called a certificate for a qualified energy project. In order to continue to utilize the, the pilot process, um, the qualified energy project must do uh, certain things under the statute. They must make their annual service payments, they must employ at least 80% of Ohio domicile employees during construction. The, that is for solar projects. Um, all projects must enter into a road use agreement with the county to repair roads, bridges, culverts, and there must be a certification by the county engineer that these re requirements and agreements have been met. Um, they need to provide training and equipment to first responders within the area for any um, emergencies related to the project that could um, possibly occur. Um, they also must establish a relationship with a state institution of higher education to educate and train individuals in career for renewable energy projects. Assuming that all of these, these items um, are complied with, then the company will receive a verification of the pilot certificate. Um, once they begin commercial operations, they will verify all these items with the Ohio Development Services Agency. And then the pilot payment will begin the following year after that verification has been made. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan for any questions that anyone has. Um, happy to answer them. Christine, thank you. And I'm going to, um, I'd like to welcome back uh, Ryan and Matt um, and Christine. Um, so if you could all bring back your audio and video. Um, we do have some questions that have been submitted. Um, so uh, Ryan and Matt, Christine, are you ready? Um, let's go. All right, Ryan, um, we will start off with an easy one because we have some tougher questions. All Ryan, right. um, we'd love for you to, to share, um, it, if you could share a story, um, I'm sure you have lots of them. So if you could share a story about how one of your projects um, has impacted you know, a, a landowner or a local business or a school, just, just a story that kind of stands out to you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one story in particular that I think resonates with, with me is, is out in Hardin County. Um, it's a large landowner that uh, is, is a big farmer in the area. And originally, he kind of brought us into the leasing process because he saw this as an excellent kind of hedge for him to avoid commodity prices that were to change, whether that's from seed or from fertilizer or, or, or otherwise, or either 
dealing with weather throughout um, the next 10, 15 years. And so he just leased a, a portion of his land so then he can kind of have a steady amount of income through the life of the project. And since we've now kind of gone in construction and operations of the Harden One Solar Project, I know that he's actually been utilizing those, those funds to either change what he's been planting to kind of do something different from the, the corn or soy that he's typically been doing. And now I know he's actually looking to grow his operation even more so now that he's likely will be farming more land now that he actually leased some property to us so we can have allow for solar development and kind of utilizing those funds to actually uh, invest more into his farming operations. Great. So, so I'm guessing that um, some of your landowners don't necessarily land, uh, lease all of their land. They'll That's correct. They'll continue to farm some and then lease, lease the other land. Okay. You got it. That's great. Okay, so enough of the easy questions. Um, we're gonna get we're gonna get to the hard ones. Okay, and this is for any of you three. Okay, Ryan, Mac, Christine. Um, what is some of the more um, common misinformation regarding utility solar development that you have come across in Ohio? Um, Ryan, how have you managed this, um, Matt? for you that impacts you as well during the OPSB process. So I'm going to open this up to any of you. Sure, maybe I, I can take first cut on, on how we manage on the development side. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's really important for the developers to recognize how large of a change in use this is. Uh, often these areas in which we're developing have been farmed for generations and effectively we are coming in and, and changing that land use for the next 30, 40 years. And, and it's something that's completely different. And with that large amount of change, uh, there's always a little bit of, of, of apprehension and a little bit of fear. And I think it's a developer's job to know that upfront, that with a huge change in use, there has there is always apprehension. And so it's, it's my job really to get out there in the community very early and begin to address a lot of the, the apprehensions that could potentially come with a large change of use. And, it, and it's really important that I don't necessarily say, hey, you're wrong. It's really important for me to listen and be partners either with the, the adjacent landowners or with the key decision makers or with the folks here on the, on the webinar to ensure that we are partners. And, and for us at Invenergy, no project is the same. And we want to make sure that we're prescriptive for each one of our developments to ensure that we are meeting the questions and concerns in, in the local community. So that, that's a huge part of my job is going out there often and early to, to ensure that we are hearing the questions, hearing the concerns, kind of telling our message to ensure that we can kind of combat some of those, those, those items. Matt, I know this is a tough one for you too. <laughs> yeah, I can add to that a little bit. Um, sure. I, I agree with Ryan, I really do. Uh, in terms of myths or misconceptions, I think it's really more on the industry to um, to work through some of those issues with, with landowners and members of the community where they may, where they may arise. Um, the board's role is more to act as the judge in these cases. So we are going to listen to you know, all the concerns that come in. We're going to listen to the folks who, who have questions, who have, um, who are in support, who are in opposition to. Um, I think the one thing that we can do is ensure the public that we will make sure that the applicant is adhering to all the requirements under the, the laws and rules of Ohio, and that they're going to follow through on the terms and conditions of the certificate or permit that would be issued for their project. Matt, let me go, let me ask you this. Um, if, if a public comment um, has, presents data that they have, whatever, and it can be in support of a project, it can be in opposition of the project. If they present certain findings, how does the board consider that? So through the um, through the investigation period where I, that I talked about earlier with the um, with the staff review, when we get comments that uh, include data or information that um, that staff thinks may be useful um, and and helpful, we may take that and ask the developer some follow up questions based on that on that information. And um, you know if they're 
if there's more information to glean based on what someone has presented, we'll do our best to get that information out of the, the applicant. Um, post investigation, it's really in the board's hands. Um, and most of that input comes by way of the public hearing and the adjudicatory hearing. So if someone presents data or evidence through the course of those hearings, then you know that becomes part of the, the record of the case and the board would have to consider that before they make their decision. Thanks, Christine, anything to add on this? I don't think that so. I think uh, Matt and Ryan did a great job. There are a lot of myths out there, um, but I think as Ryan said, there's, it's not a one size fits all. Every project is unique and every individual um, is listened to, to be sure that they understand the project itself. Matt, one more question for you um, in terms of who is who is listening today? Uh, what is most useful, do you think, for Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development leaders to offer when they are providing comments on a solar project, a large scale solar project? Um, well, I think, um, you know, in the course of our review, the applicant has to provide an economic impact study. And that primarily deals with impacts, including jobs, um, output from the project, um, what it might provide to the community in terms of income, um, both during construction and through operation. Um, and then also the tax implications of the project, um, you know, the benefits there. So I think those are some of the key issues. Um, if I were an economic development uh, official, or a member of a chamber of commerce, those are some of the issues that I probably would, would hone in on, just like with any significant economic development project. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Christine, this gives us a nice transition to another question that we have regarding the pilot. Um, Christine, as you've na navigated countless projects and, um, and have overseen the pilot, et cetera. What do you see as the major advantages for a county to choose to proceed with the pilot versus choosing a more traditional tax structure? I think that's a good question. Um, you know, the pilot provides the opportunity for a consistent and known um, tax revenue uh, receipt by the county. It also gives the uh, developer and the project itself um, a knowing amount of revenue that they will be uh, putting into the community. Um, it's definitely a, a, a tax and uh, revenue increase for the county and for all of the taxing units. It is definitely a benefit. Um, more, they will be receiving more revenue than they would have under um, the current uh, non uh, project uh, area. So that is definitely a benefit. It also provides a, a, a large in, influx of uh, money for the school districts themselves, which is a bonus for those school districts. And Susan, I, I do um, see that there's a, a comment, just a question about whether or not there's also a, a similar project um, process with the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority. And that is true. There is, it has not been used wisely or widely, um, but it is a very similar structure to what the Ohio Development Services Agency provides with regard to the pilot. Uh, we did not go into that, um, but similar information is provided in a similar process. Well, that's great, Christine. So what I heard you say is that the pilot provides an increase in taxes for the county more so than they would have if they went the traditional route. Or uh, right, if if you the difference between a pilot and a non-pilot is the pilot provides a consistent annual amount of revenue that the county and the schools can rely on. Um, for an, in a non-pilot situation. Um, there is a depreciation schedule that will be mm -hmm. um, applied. So beginning in year one, um, the tax will be a certain amount, but beginning in year 30, at the end of the project's uh, useful life, it will be much less. 
Okay. That is, that is really, really helpful. And, and I'll say that sometimes seems to be um, a point that's not well understood or embraced, or there's just a lot of misinformation surrounding that. So thank you. Thank you for that um, clarification. And I think we are going to um, transition now and wrap up. Holly, Ryan, Matt, Christine, thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. Um, Next up, you are not going to want to miss this, the follow-up to today. We're inviting all Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development staff on today's call and in these project areas to join us in person for our next event, Navigating Utility Scale Solar Myths misinformation and local conflict. We're gonna take a deep dive into what's being shared, how chambers can best navigate and lead through local conflict. This takes place on Friday, October 8th, um, and it's going to be 10.30 to 2.30 p.m. um, in person at First Solar in Perrysburg. And so it's going to be, and we're going to give you a wonderful lunch as well. We're going to tour for solar, hear from industry experts uh, regarding common misinformation, top myths, and the well-organized tactics that are out there to hinder utility scale solar development. We'll have a roundtable dialogue facilitated by Brian Dickin, Vice President of Advocacy and Strategic Initiatives with the Toledo Regional Chamber. The floor is going to be open for you all to share what you're seeing and hearing in your community so that we can all share best practices, um, share challenges, and figure out the best way um, that we can be that voice of business in our communities. We really look forward to being together in person on October 8th at First Solar. Meanwhile, um, I believe my contact info is on the screen now. Contact me anytime with questions or definitely go to chambersforinnovation.com. Speakers, thank you so much. Um, Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.